So I finished reading The Two Towers, or rather rereading The Two Towers, about a week ago, but then I got sick, so I haven't had the chance to film. So forgive me if some of the finer details are already forgotten. I still remember the story quite well, but also, you know, I usually try to do my reviews a little bit closer to actually finishing the book. So I'm going to start my discussion on The Two Towers in the most logical place possible, and that is by discussing the Fellowship of the Ring a little bit more. In my last review discussion chat, I, I basically just talked about how my impressions have changed about the Fellowship of the Ring uh, from my first read to my second read and just kind of process that with you and then I wanted to structure these next two reviews more like proper reviews. But ever since I put up that video, I have regretted not discussing something that happened at the very end, so we're gonna discuss it. That scene at the end of Fellowship when Sam finally finds Frodo and runs out to the boat and uh, launches himself off the dock and tries to get into the boat and then he doesn't make it the Frodo pulls him back in. Man, that scene was so intense because it really, uh, first of all, Sam's loyalty is unmatched. It's so beautiful how, how truly devoted he is to Frodo and to his mission. And seeing that love and loyalty displayed through that reckless act of doing everything he can to get to him to just make sure Frodo isn't alone and he has someone looking out for him no matter it doesn't matter that Frodo is making a really dumb decision and running off when he needs the protection around him that he has that doesn't matter to Sam what matters to Sam is whatever you choose to do Frodo take me with you and then Frodo who has determined the best bet for me here is to be alone and so he's leaving everyone behind even sam and even um mary and pippin and when he sees sam's desperate act instead of just leaving him behind and being like he can swim he'll get back to the the dock he's like no i i gotta i gotta pull him back into the boat i need him here with me and that just that ugh, that act of love and devotion Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh man, I wrote down the quote I wanted to start this review off with. Hang on. There's another thing from book one that I wanted to mention that I forgot to put in my review of Fellowship. What will you do to open them? Pippin asked. Knock on the doors with your head, said Gandalf. But if that doesn't shatter them, and I'm allowed a little piece from stupid questions, I may remember the opening words. I love Gandalf's incredible impatience, specifically with Pippin. Pippin is such a curious guy. He just wants answers for everything. And he is constantly, like, he's that annoying kid that's constantly right at your shoulder asking you questions about everything you do. And I love him for that. And I also love how irritated Gandalf is about it. Even in The Two Towers, there's a time where he actually allows Pippin to ask all his questions and Pippin's like, man, I gotta get all these out as fast as I can because so far Gandalf hasn't noticed that he's annoyed by me. That's not how he words it, but that's my interpretation. And I love their dynamics. Just in general, I love the dynamics of the characters in this series totally. I had someone recently comment on one of my videos saying that my love for the Lord of the Rings has to be nostalgia because there's no way I actually love these books just for the books because the character work is atrocious. And man, I just can't disagree more. I think that these characters are so well built and their relationship dynamics are just so much fun to watch unfold. I love these characters. Um, for instance, Gimli and Legolas, who start out with this prejudice for each other's um, cultures and races, and then they grow to love each other so much. Um, and then Merry and Pippin and Frodo and Sam, their whole dynamics. Um, I love Gandalf's frustration with Pippin, like I mentioned. And pretty much every character in this book, their dynamics with any other character you pair them against. I just, I just think that it's so well written um, how how they interact with each other and and the growth of their bond over over this uh, over the Lord of the Rings. I I'm trying not to call it a trilogy because I know that makes some of you really mad, 
but it's it's tough, you know? It was written as one book, it was published as six, now it's regularly published as three. It's, it's just, it's, you, you call it what you call it. Anyway, now let's properly talk about book two, because uh, I do have a little bit that I want to talk about there as well. Um, so the first big thing that I want to talk about, because it does happen really early on, is the ends. So the ends are are something that people seem to regularly hate, and I genuinely don't understand it, because the Ents, I think, offer so much depth to this world, as well as so much tragedy. Treebeard, specifically, is such a beautiful, tragic character. And I was actually listening to the audiobook for Two Towers while I was grocery shopping, and I was literally crying in the grocery store, walking up and down the aisles, listening to him talk about his wife and the Ant Wives, and, talk, and sing his song about them waiting for them to come home. It's so tragic, and I, I get that it's a lot of monologuing, which, boy, there's a lot of monologuing in these books, period. But I just think that the culture around the Ents is so beautiful, and I'm so grateful that we spent so much time there. I think that Treebeard is a hilarious and fascinating and fun character. Uh, when when Mary and Pippin ask him how long they have to travel to get to where he's taking them, and he he's, I can't remember exactly, but he says something like, a hundred strides for me. I have no idea how long it would take for you, but that doesn't really matter, does it? And just, I, I, I know I butchered that line. I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. but. It seems like almost everything it, that comes out of his mouth, the way he reacts to Merry and Pippin's culture and the way he explains his own is either incredibly deep or so, so funny. And I love it. I'm so sad that there's not a true resolu resolution for the Entwives because I want to know what happened to them. And I know Tolkien did talk about it after the series was complete and it's not a happy ending, but... I want a happy ending, I want to know that they come home, but there's a reason for it, of course. I, I understand that this world, or at least as I understand it, this world is meant to be how our world was, and it's kind of showing the magic dying, and eventually the world becomes as it is now. And part of that is the Ents dying out and just becoming normal trees, but that's so tragic, and it looks so much like you know, a sweet old man who has so much story to tell and and his time is coming to an end and it just, it's so, it's so beautiful but so sad to read and I'm so grateful that Tolkien took so much time to write it. Speaking of monologues, let's talk about the monologues in this book because um, this is one thing that I don't love about Tolkien's writing is he 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 loves he loves just having characters tell you a story and sometimes that's great like with the ents and sometimes i hate it like with gandalf when he finally lets us know where he's been and what held him up and what happened to him when we all thought he died and we're just we're just sitting there listening to him talk for like an entire chapter and the whole time i'm just thinking this would be so cool to have watched it's not so cool to listen to him tell me. It's, it's kind of like the telling versus showing, which I'm sure wasn't a rule at the point that these books were written. But it's, it's, there's some times where I appreciate a good story and, sorry, my battery died. I understand that this, that this culture is, is really wrapped around storytelling and just chatting, um, sitting around and chatting around a fire and like just telling your full story and all that is very much a part of the culture and so there is, an element of that that was intentional, but also there are times where I think it works and there are times where I wish we didn't do it that way. I do wish that we got to see some of the action that Gandalf was in on, especially since this is such a moving POV story. It's not like it would be outlandish for us to see this stuff happen to Gandalf. Um, when Merry and Pippin meet up with the rest of the crew, which is, oh my gosh, it's amazing. The camaraderie and the pure joy of seeing each other is, ah, I love it, I love it. I love how much these characters love each other. I thought it was hilarious when they were talking about sitting around and smoking pipes together, and then they were all really sad that they had to share a pipe, and then I believe it was Mary, but I don't remember exactly. Someone responded with, oh, here, I just remembered, I've been carrying this pipe from my childhood in my pocket this entire time. Don't know why, because 
there's no reason for me to have carry, carried it because we don't have any tobacco, but turns out I have an extra pipe. You want it, Gimli? It's like it's the most random conversation about something that doesn't matter at all. And then randomly he's just like, I've been carrying this in my pocket the whole time. Forgot, but here it is. You want it? It's just, it's so, it's so silly. Anyway, going back to it, when they finally all rejoin and it's that beautiful, ah, that beautiful reunion. Um, again, Mary and Pippin just spend pages and pages telling them what happened to them. And it's crazy because we spent a lot of time with Mary and Pippin watching things unfold with them. And then, and then rather than continuing to experience things with them, we get a monologue again. Obviously monologues are shorter to read and eventually you have to cut the story off and the amount of world building that Tolkien had for us, he did need to pick and choose what he was going to include. but. I just, the monologuing of like just explanation when I would have liked to experience things with characters is not always my favorite. Okay, next I should probably talk about Sam and Frodo um, because I think this is where the perspective changes if I'm remembering correctly. I really, it's been a week and so the general structure and flow of the story I've, I've lost. So I'm gonna skip over them for the moment and get to Gimli and Legolas because I wanna finish talking about them before I go to Sam and Frodo. Gimli and Legolas are some of my favorite characters and one of my favorite relationships in this book. I kind of already talked about it in this review, but I love to watch them grow together and learn to love each other and the bond that they develop. This is the book <laughs> where the infamous scene that I love so much and I loved the first time around. And again, I didn't write it down, so I'm gonna be paraphrasing, but Essentially, Ghibli goes on this long discussion about how beautiful his homeland is and how amazing his culture is. And, and Legolas lets him talk for a long time about all this stuff. And then Legolas listens to him throughout this whole thing. And then Legolas says, wow, I never would have guessed that your home is so beautiful. I'd love to visit it. And he suggests that when this is all over, they'll travel back together and they'll stop where Legolas is from with the elves and he can show Gimli his home and how beautiful his land is and introduce him to his culture. And then from there, they'll travel together to where Gimli's from and then Legolas can get to know Gimli's culture and Gimli's land. And Gimli's response after Legolas listened to Gimli rant for so long and then offered this sweet, kind proposal, Gimli's response is essentially well, that's not how I would choose to do it, but if I have to suffer through spending time with the elves in order to share a drink with you where I'm from, I guess I'll bear it. And I just, I love, I love their dynamics, um, especially Gimli's just like brutal honesty about how he feels, even though he, he's developed this, this loving friendship with, friendship with Legolas, he still just is completely indifferent about elves in general, but he still loves Legolas and he wants him to come home with him and experience his own land, but he's like, I don't really care about your life. I just really love their dynamics. I, I, I it makes me so happy. I love Leg Legolas and Gimli. All right, let's talk about Sam and Frodo. So Sam and Frodo meet up with Gollum. And this is a really interesting dynamic because I, I feel for Smeagol a little bit throughout this because Sam truly is quite harsh with him. Sam does not want to be his friend, does not want to play nice, regularly insults him. Sam does not trust Smeagol. And I put myself in Sam's shoes and I get it. Um, not only has he proven himself untrustworthy in the past, but he acts really shady. And we know that he's only truly loyal because he wants the ring, not because he has any desire for any goodness to happen. So Sam's distaste for Smeagol makes sense. His name calling and I, I think he takes it too far and I feel for him and I feel like this is an instance where if he had treated him better, things could have gone differently. But I do sympathize with Sam's position and I do respect where he's coming from even though I think that he could have handled it a million times better. Frodo at least tried. He really did try. He was like, I get it. I get Sam. I get your feelings. but. I think he's giving us the chance to be on good terms with him, so let's try to treat him nicely. This is one part of the story that I loved because for whatever reason, I could not remember what they what happens here. I, I wanted to think that Gollum was going to betray them, but I couldn't, 
I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember how it goes down. I couldn't remember if he does betray them or not. And so this whole time I was on the edge of my seat too. And I was really feeling for Sam's position because I didn't fully trust him either, but I wanted to trust him because he seemed like he was suddenly being more trustworthy than he has in the past, but also he was acting super shady. And I just really felt like I could sympathize with the genuine fear that Frodo and Sam must have been going through being led along by someone that they have no idea if he's actually helping them or not. I think it was so well written. You know, this is a story that we all know at this point. Even if you haven't read the books, you know the story. And I think that a lot of uh, of the nuance in this is is n overlooked and not noticed because we know the story, but I forgot this part of the story somehow. And I really appreciated how it was written and how much tension was written into this because I genuinely didn't know either and I was scared with these characters because every time every time they trusted Smeagol a little bit more I was afraid he would betray them but every time Sam would goad him a little bit more I was also nervous because I thought he was on our side and I didn't want to push him away I just think it was so well done and I was really on the edge of my seat too and then of course he does betray them and they have the giant spider attack I couldn't remember that either and the whole time I was I was just in awe because I remembered it being over so fast and it wasn't. It was really dramatic. When Frodo died, I couldn't figure out what was going on because I didn't remember his death the first time I read this book. And I, I was like, I know he's in book three. I remember him being in The Return of the King, but he's not, he's dead. And Sam is going through this, this turmoil of mourning his friend who he's so loyal to, but then also thinking, I have to continue this. Like, I have to take the ring to Mordor. I have to finish this task. And he's like, but I don't want to. I was never meant to be that guy, and I don't want to be that guy. His pain over losing Frodo, and then his turmoil of, I have to finish this out on my own, and that's the last thing I want to do. It should be Frodo. I want Frodo to be the one who, who does this thing that is has supposed to do it for he was supposed to be the one that did it from the start i just the whole time i was feeling what sam was feeling i was so like i was mourning frodo's lost and i was in disbelief and i was like he, he can't be gone but then yeah sam you got to take the ring you got to do it but sam doesn't want to he doesn't want to be the hero of the story he is but he doesn't want to be he wants frodo to be the hero of the story and he just wants to help frodo get there and now frodo's gone and it was so intense also sam's fighting skills whoa man i feel like already so many details are lost on me i don't know what it is i i'm 27 now and used to be i could read a book and it would stick with me like the details of it would stick with me for years and now i'm 27 and i feel like the details of a book are lost i i forget them so fast it's not because i'm reading fast i'm reading at the same pace i've always read at it's just i just i can't retain this stuff anymore anyway thankfully frodo is not dead but now we're in a very sticky situation and i i have already started book three at the point of continuing at the point of, of filming this review but i'm not very far into it yet and i'm already i can't remember i i've lost so much information of the series so feel like I'm experiencing it with them and I have no idea what's gonna happen except for the ending I know the ending and uh, man it's awesome I hope I hope I can keep my kids from watching the movies first and somehow keep them from spoilers because man I I would love for them to be able to experience this first through the books because I feel like I'm almost doing that right now and it's intense anyway I I feel almost like a poser <laughs> reviewing these books because this is only my second read through and I I don't know this year. I feel like people that are going to review The Lord of the Rings because it's so rich in culture and because it has such a devoted fan base, I feel like people that are going to review these books should be the people that have read them a dozen times already. So I feel odd discussing because I know I'm getting some details wrong and I know I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff because I'm not seeing a lot of the nuance in the in the in the books and the world and I 
I want to read these books a dozen times. I love these books. I want to read them a dozen times. I want to know all the nuance. I want to know this world like the back of my hand and all the culture. And I, I really want to delve into this world. And I feel like I shouldn't be doing these reviews until I do that. So forgive me for any mistakes that I make and any, any stuff that I just don't get yet. Um, but I do have a question for you guys. I'm curious if you guys know of a YouTube channel that is really deep into the lore of The Lord of the Rings. I really want to delve into the lore a lot more. I've read The Silmarillion and I want to read it again, um, but like a YouTube channel that just talks about the world and dives deep into the meaning of things. If you guys know of a Lord of the Rings YouTube channel, man, I would be very grateful if you could link them in the description, I mean in the comments of this video because I would love to explore that. Anyway, book three is a really emotional one for me. I don't remember a lot of details from the book, but I do remember <laughs> that it was the book that I was reading last year when my grandpa passed away and he has been a big part of my life. So that book kind of helped me get through a really hard time. So it's gonna be an emotional read, but I am as ready as I can possibly be. So. I'm grateful that this is the series that helped me run away when I needed a break from life because it's a world that I'm grateful for on its own, but I'm also grateful for what it provided for me a year ago. And uh, I'm excited to, to reread that book too. And we'll talk about it when I do. Okay, I post videos every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I post my reviews on my off days. I'll see you guys again soon.